It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 74, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. John DeVazio manages a plant breeding program at Johnny Selected Seeds in Albion, Maine. In today's episode, John takes us on a seedy tour of the early days of organic and local vegetable production and his journey into the world of variety selection, horizontal resistance, participatory plant breeding, and why seed quality and quality varietal maintenance matters for every farmer. We dig into the modern history of hybrids, why open pollinated crops can be a competitive alternative, and why some of your favorite hybrid varieties just up and disappear, as well as why some of your favorite open pollinated varieties devolve over time while others just get better was a lot of fun getting to talk to my good friend, John DeVazio, again. I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did and get just as much out of it as I did. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost space living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by you. In response to requests I've received from listeners, we're rolling out some new ways for you to support the show. I'll have more information for you at the break, or you can just head straight over to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate if you can't wait. John Navazio, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer Podcast. Very good to be here, Chris. Thank you very much. So pleased that you could make it onto the show. You know, we've known each other for a long time. And I mean, I remember meeting you for the first time, Christian Phil, when I was at the University of Wisconsin in the potato program there as an undergrad, said, you've got to meet this guy, John Navazio. He's like, <laughs> I love it. He, this guy's like your brother from another mother. You know, he's somebody that you really, you know and and you connect with. And, you know, this was at a time, this would have been back in like 1992, yeah, 91 or 92, right in there, yeah. And at the University of Wisconsin, I mean, there just there was nothing going on with organics. There was, you know, everything in the plant breeding world was all focused on on GMOs and that whole side of things. And if we and I just remember Christian was like, this guy is like the only other guy I know here at the school who's like you. And um, and I just remember, and then we've, and and as we've gone through our lives, you know, we kind of had these funny spots where we've, we've intersected. And I know you've had a lot to do with, with me getting into various positions, whether it was working at Seed Savers or out at Beach Hill Farm in Maine and help me through some, some difficult times. So all of that being said, I'd really like to hear in your words about your history and how, how you got into seed and plant breeding and how that whole thing has progressed for you. Okay, great. That can be a long story, but uh, there's some parts of it that are really worthwhile in in context of the whole blossoming of the seed uh, consciousness in the past 30 years. So let's dive right into that. And I will say, uh, good old Chris Thill was a good judge of character, and he, in him being the one who introduced us, he definitely recognized that, that common ground you and I had. And I will say this, too, and I hadn't thought of this in a while, but at the University of Wisconsin, as progressive of a place as it's always been in agriculture and more, uh, in the early 90s, uh, late 80s, I didn't tell most people that I had uh, this former life as an organic farmer when I went to grad school for plant breeding, because it still wasn't, uh, it still was not accepted as uh, a legitimate form of agricultural uh, production, really, even at good old liberal University of Wisconsin. So that's an interesting footnote. So certainly Chris Bell, who was my best friend as a grad student, uh, was uh, he knew about that part of me, so he recognized it in you. And that, that, I still remember the day I met you, what do you think? The other thing I remember about that day is that the University of Wisconsin is one of the few places back then where you could actually get beer at the student union. And I had no idea that it was acceptable to have beer over lunch while you were going to college. I was like, this is great. (laughs) Well, that's a German influence of Wisconsin, (laughs) right? I think. Anyway, and we'll talk a little bit more about University of Wisconsin. And that was, there were some dynamic, wonderful things. And you were in that a uh, great lab run by Stan Pelliquin in the at the end of his career. What a uh, inspiration! One of my mentors, the great potato cytogeneticist and breeder Stan Pelliquin, who uh, mentored so many uh, good young plant breeders. And and you were an undergrad. And what a neat thing for you to get that inspiration of that program at the time as well, just uh, as an undergrad. Incredible stroke of luck for me. Absolutely. Uh, for all of us who were there at the time. 
Um, okay, the history. I was a, I, I'm a suburban kid from Alexandria, Virginia, originally. The first way I became conscious of farming really was my grandmother talking about my great grandfather, who was a strawberry and asparagus farmer on Staten Island of all places within the city of New York, one of the five boroughs. He was at a two acre intensive operation and got top dollar for his asparagus and, and berries. And, uh, so I always, I, I love those stories. I, you know, as a suburban brat who'd never been, never set foot on a farm. I love that whole background. I could listen to her stories forever about being back on the farm. Then that coincided just perfectly with the whole back to the land movement of the early 70s. And people often say back to the land started in the 60s. And I guess its its roots were certainly in the 60s, but it really blossomed right at the, the beginning of the whole environmental consciousness and all of that that really started in 1970, 71. And um, it's, it's hard to tell people now how impressionable all of us as young, you know, I was a teenager at the time in high school and I was starting to grow gardens and I was starting to think about, you know, the better life away from the rat race of the city and the burbs. And I could see how flat all of that was in, uh, as far as cultural richness. And, um, so it really had a profound effect on a lot of us. And when it was time to go to college, I, it, it was really easy to figure out I'm going to agriculture school in 73 when I started in New England at ag school. And um, there were a lot of like-minded people at that time who were into it and who really had their vision was to be organic. And as much as that still was disparaged by the professors, uh, some of them, the older ones, put up with it a little bit more than the younger ones. But we were pretty dead set on it. But the thing that you have to remember about those years in the 70s, when really all of the cycle of agriculture that we're now in started, of the of the uh, true sustainability in agriculture, there were very few good working farms for us to go work at or latch on to or, or to watch what they were doing. It was, we'd read about it in organic uh, farming and gardening magazine, as it was still called, which was a very important uh, publication for all of us. Of course, no internet, nothing like this on any kind of media, very little on anything like uh, that would come across our, our doorsteps. So things like organic gardening and what they were doing at Rodale Institute, very important uh, as a lifeline to what was possible. But in those early years, I really wanted to work on a farm, and there was uh, very little opportunity to do that. Uh, so I even remember as a teenager, 16, 17, going over to the eastern shore of Maryland where some friends had a summer home, and I knew there were farms out there, and I knew they grew tomatoes and melons out on the eastern shore of Maryland. And I would just hitchhike around and go to fields where I saw them picking and say, hey, can I have a job? And all of a sudden I was working as a migrant laborer. Of course, I didn't have to do it to make, you know, it was just, it was just spending money, pocket money for me. And I'd work with these Jamaican crews who were really an eye opening, certainly culturally and also the whole political aspects of food uh, eye opener right from the beginning of my interaction with ag. That's how desperate we were, some of us, to work on farms. There just weren't many options. There weren't this whole plethora of good organic farmers in every region to go say, hey, I want to be an intern. It didn't exist yet. So when I graduated from, uh, from ag school in the mid-70s, mid to late 70s, I started working for, I, I fulfilled two dreams. I wanted to be out west, and a couple of times I'd traveled out west, the big horizons and the big blue sky. Uh, I started going to the Rocky Mountain states and, and ended up working on wildland fire crews for the Forest Service for a couple of years. And it was a good way to save money. And I worked during the winter because my dream was to buy a farm, but I had no idea, you know, how to do that. Again, we didn't have mentors who were young organic farmers at that time. There were some of these good old timers were out there, but they were few and far between. Long about, and this is an important historical footnote, in 1981 is when I really worked on my first farm where it all started, where I got all of the 
good preliminary lessons. And that was, I was actually going to work my third year on a fire crew at, out of Mount Hood National Forest. I was hitchhiking to it, stopped in Eugene, Oregon. I was a couple of days early for reporting for duty. I walked into a health store in Eugene in 1981, the Kiva. I believe it's still there in Eugene for any of your Oregonian listeners who are listening to this. Um, but the Kiva had a produce section where they had two things on the sign I had never seen before. Uh, organically grown cer- and was tilt certified at that time, but organically grown, local organically grown, and then it actually said the name of the farms. And for somebody who had been starved from the knowledge of where these organic farms were out in the greater world, that was like, oh my God, that was a breath of fresh air. It's like, wow, here, and this was in May, 1981, they already had lettuce on the shelves. They already had spinach on the shelves. There were a few of the spring crops that hurt radishes. And I went up to the produce manager and I said, my God, this is so cool. You got, you're working with these local farms. Can you give me the phone number for these farms? And uh, the woman who was the manager gave me, wrote them down, three numbers for me of the three farms that were selling stuff at that point, very early in the season. And uh, I went out to the nearest phone booth and called Thistlebrook Organic. I literally did. Walked down the street to the nearest phone booth and called them up. And a guy named Tom Lively uh, answered the phone. And Tom and David Lively, I then worked with for the next three years. Uh, Tom, it was, this was one of those famous phone calls. I, I have about three of these phone calls in my life where I call somebody up and 45 minutes later, after we're gabbing, you know, they finally say, now what did you call me for? And uh, I said, hey, man, can I work with you guys? Uh, you know, you're doing it. This is real organic veg farm. And he said, yeah, but we're not going to be able to pay you. Maybe by the middle of June, you can get your first paycheck. Because uh, right now, we're just getting enough money to buy the rest of the fertilizer and seeds for the year. And I said, no problem, no problem. So I had to then, the next phone call I made was to call the Forest Service and say I'd gotten a better offer. <laughs> I ended up working there for three years. Um, it was a really innovative farm. Thistlebrook Organics later became the incorporated sold name Riverbrook Farm. Uh, Keith Walton um, was a kid who grew up on the farm who was uh, very adept at all the tractor work and shop work and all of that important stuff you have to have on a good working farm. And And David and Tom Lively, who went on to the founders of organic, organically grown company on the West Coast, now the second largest distributor of uh, organic produce on the West Coast. Those were my buds. Those were the guys that we learned it together with a, another group of cast of characters who, who moved through. But um, essentially, we were co-op owners. And, uh, and the other first thing I saw that summer was I saw Johnny's Selected Seeds catalog. Tom was an uh, early adopter of Johnny's was only about seven or eight years old. And Tom never bought one variety of any vegetable, seed of any one variety. He'd always buy three or four. He'd study the catalogs. I learned how to study seed catalogs from watching Tom sit there at the desk and studying and reading the descriptions and figuring out what was what potentially was best for our climate there in the Willamette Valley. What really struck me very quickly is that there were there were true, you know, true differences. There were, every tomato was not created equal by any means. And so I started learning all of that really fast, and I became a, a real variety junkie. Uh, you know, what's the best thing to grow for this season? What's the best kale for overwintering in Oregon? What's the best leek for early sales with the fat uh the fat stems versus the, the ones that overwinter better, blah, 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 you know, just on and on. And Tom and I really were partners in crime in that of, of running sort of observation plots. They weren't real randomized uh, replicated trials, but we certainly learned one hell of a lot from that. But yet seed was still something that came in a package and seed was still something we bought from Johnny's or bought from Sutton's in England. We knew we could get really neat stuff for our overwearing needs in the maritime Northwest from England. 
but we didn't really know where the seed came from. So now I'll fast forward to my last summer at uh, Riverbrook, and uh, we had this visit. We'd occasionally get visits from other farmers there because we really did do a, a pretty darn good job, and we were we were running about five or six acres of uh, lettuce uh, every summer uh, on rotation, probably through the season, and uh, we're pretty skilled at it. Tom had really figured a lot out growing up in Arizona, this sort of thing. So we had visitors who'd want to see how we did it, and we were always very uh, gracious and would sure, we'll show you what we're doing. We know we're doing good, and there's there's room for everybody here. So we have this, uh, a couple of guys come up from Southern Oregon, and uh, they wanted to see how we did the lettuce operation. One of them was just a farmer who kind of came and went. I think his family had a little money and was setting up a farm. But the other person who he hired as a consultant was a guy named Gabriel Howard. And Gabriel Howard, in the pantheons of uh, modern seed, um, awakening was, I really think of him as kind of the coca uh, that uh, Southwestern Hopi Indian uh, playing the flute and talking to the uh, agricultural gods. Cause this guy was a, a real natural with seed and really infected a lot of other um, farmers at the time with the, with the desire to be in touch with the seed. And I spent the better part of an afternoon walking around just with Gabriel while the rest of the boys were talking business and looking at crops. And he'd, you know, I'd show him our watermelons, yellow doll watermelon, I distinctly remember at the time. And, you know, you know we cut one open to, to eat it. And he started spitting the seeds into his hand to save them, to take them back home and grow them. And I said, I said, well, that is a hybrid. And I don't think you can grow seeds from hybrid. He said, Oh, sure you can. You know, look at something a little bit different, but yeah, I'm, I want to see what I get from this. And with that, Chris, I really like, wow, it was like, here's a whole nother deeper level. I was already into the varieties and how unique they were and how important it was to be tuned into the varieties. But the fact that all of a sudden you could be a partner in that, in that uh, the seed was actually part of your doing and you commandeering the, the, uh, what was grown on the farm and the seeds. It all came to me, came together for me, really, that the first time that afternoon. And then that just was perfect timing by the mid 80s. And we're starting to read stories about Kent Whaley and Seed Savers Exchange. I remember an article about Will Bonsall, uh, still alive and kicking here in Maine uh, as a seed saver. And um, uh, I really started to put it all together. So the next chapter of my life was moving to Maine, came back to New England just to visit friends and ended up staying for five years. Uh, had to take a break from the farm because we were farming dawn to dark 30, as all good farmers do. But the thing about the Pacific Northwest is you tend to farm year round there and you never get that winter break that so many of us in northern climes and in colder places get to enjoy, which I relish today. Once I got to Maine and ended up with a real group of, uh, of, of neat, young, agriculturally minded people in the Bar Harbor area, um, and I started teaching at College of the Atlantic, and I started managing the student farm, the student farm kind of became a, a seed saving project at COA. And I was teaching a class where I had a heavy emphasis on seed saving at College of the Atlantic. And there was a real emphasis. And that's when I really started to hone my seed skills. And I really started to voraciously read everything about it. And in fact, um, an old uh, boss that you and I both had at Beach Hill Farm, uh, Barbarina Heyerdahl, set, uh, sent uh, Terry Matson and I on a little trip across the country to uh, check out other research stations and people doing things with uh, seeds and cold climates and things like that. So uh, long about the summer, I guess that was 87, we visited plant breeders in different parts of the country from the alternative ones uh, like Alan Tapular in Oregon to people like Phil Simon at the University of Wisconsin and, and Jim Baggett at Oregon State and the sugar beet program at Utah State University, that was a whole revelation. Visited the seed bank in Fort Collins. I mean, it was a real seed extravaganza trip. It was really 
monumental because all of a sudden I realized, gee, there's this whole research and science element to it as well. So it didn't take long, another couple of years in Maine before it was, you know what, I've got to go be a plant breeder. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the only logical way to take this because I realized the, 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 the power to actually select and breed for the needs of the small diversified farmer was just not being met. And it was really, there was nobody doing it at that time. Well, it really was. I mean, at that point, you had seeds for gardeners, and then you had seeds for farmers, and there, there, really, there really wasn't anything in between. The seeds for farmers weren't, well, the, the local farm scene just, it didn't exist in the same way that it, it does it now. It wasn't on anyone's radar. They didn't appreciate it. And farms were only getting bigger and bigger, that whole trend. And actually, garden seed was very rarely would anyone breed anything for the garden seed trade. What would happen is a plant breeder at a at one of the big, uh, you know, the bigger companies that hire and maintain plant breeding and and uh, research units, they would occasionally have something. They'd say, "Well, this is a nice tomato. It's never going to make it in the in the big leagues as far as a field run tomato with all of the." Uh, bells and whistles that, you know, a commercial tomato has to make, but it's a cute little tomato and it tastes nice. So we'll release it to the home garden division or we'll sell it to maybe to one of the home garden companies that buy seed from us. And so home garden seed was either older varieties that were time tested and true, or they were kind of hand-me-downs from modern breeding projects. And all of the breeding was really geared to the big high profit valleys like the Salinas Valley and, and uh, 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 the Winter Garden area, Texas, and you know, Florida, all that sort of thing. And uh, I had a vision of, oh, my God, what if you did plant breeding for all of these organic people and all of their market needs? I hadn't yet thought of the whole thing of, gee, we could actually breed for organic systems. That hadn't quite crossed my my. Uh, my radar yet, but certainly it's like, let's get all the market traits that are necessary for the small diversified organic farmer. So I applied to grad school, very fortunate to get in at Wisconsin, kind of by the skin of my teeth, because I'd been a, uh, you know, I'd been the, as one of my professors used to call it, the inspired B minus student as an undergrad. So (laughs) I I actually got into Wisconsin under on probation. But I quickly, uh, once I found people, uh, kindred spirits like Buck Gobbleman, and who actually helped me get in, long story, but who was a, quite the classic old mid-20th century plant breeder, did a lot of good for the salt world. And people like Phil Simon and, um, and Stan Peliquin, uh, boy, those became my mentors. And I realized anything was possible. It was all about how big you dreamed in plant breeding as far as what you could do. Um, so it was a very, very fruitful time. But as I was going to say, as maybe said before, you know, those first two or three years, I flew under the radar. I didn't tell anybody I was uh, an organic farmer. I finally got uh, Bill Tracy, now still a good friend of Organic Seed Alliance and a good friend of mine. And I finally had enough trust in Bill that I, we still get about this, that I came out to him as an organic farmer in some point in the <laughs> early 90s. You know, I hadn't told any of the profs that I had been an organic farmer because I was worried they would think uh, poorly of me for that. The environment back then was um, uh, many of the professors simply had contempt for the idea that that you would try to do something that different. And it really was different at that point. So you got into the plant breeding program. Now, you you were in Phil Simon's carrot program, right? That's correct. But I was working on cucumbers. I had inherited a program. Phil was the, and still is, the leader of the USDA group at Wisconsin, which breeds uh, cucumbers, uh, carrots, and onions. And those three crops were historically placed there by the USDA. We won't go into that history, but a uh, very strong program. And Phil, to this day, concentrates 100% of his, almost 100% on uh Carrots, but he was always interested when there was unusual material. So I had actually started my grad work with Jack Staub, who was a cucumber breeder, and Phil was uh, uh, 
was impressed enough, I guess, with my work and had this very unusual uh, Chinese cucumber with orange flesh that he got me to come into his program. And that's what he worked on was pigment, uh, genetic improvement of pigments. So uh, beta carotene and carrots, he'd been doing, you know, the high beta carotene carrots for years. So all of a sudden I was working on this really um, uh, very fundamental work on on bringing this good orange flesh trait into uh, modern pickling cucumbers, something that's never really been completed, but Phil's still got a little bit of a program going on that, the germplasm is out there. But that meant everything to me, and that really gave me a vehicle. I had a real plant breeding project. A lot of students who are going to plant breeding, now, unless you're lucky enough to be in somebody's program like Phil or Bill Tracy's or somebody like Mike Mazurik at Cornell, uh, and there's a, a scattering of other ones, um, and I'm sorry if I'm leaving anybody out here. Uh, Jim Myers at Oregon State, uh, Steve Jones at Washington State. But those are the real pillars of doing, still doing practical breeding and where uh, someone can go and learn to be a plant breeder at the elbow, I guess, of uh, another plant breeder and, and get both the practical and the, uh, and the, you know, the good genetic training to back it up. So you, you went through at the University of Wisconsin. You actually got your Ph.D. there, right? Yeah, correct. Yes. Uh -huh. Then I went to work for a small seed. I was really, I was very sad being away from the organic community uh, that long. You know, it was five years in, in Madison. I got to know a couple of the organic farmers locally a little bit, like Steve Pincus, good old buddy of yours there. Um, but uh, I really felt I needed to be back with my people. You know, there's something about that. And so uh, instead of taking a job with a big company, I went to work with Garden City Seeds in Montana. And I learned quite a bit there. We had a real shoestring kind of uh, budget and that kept the thing going. But we learned a lot about how to do it in cooperating with farmers and not having our own research plots or our own seed production plots. It was actually uh, really, I realized that years later, was very informative because we just had to work with the, the organic farmers there in southwestern Montana that, we, that were friends of the uh, extended family there. And there were some great ones there and some that I'm still in contact with. Uh, but from there, I really needed to uh, pay off the loans and all of that. And I ended up going to the Alfredson Seed Company in the Skagit Valley of Washington. And it was another fortuitous thing there because the Alfredson Seed Company, which is no longer exists, there's still some packages that I say that sold by Sakata. But Sakata Seeds eventually of Japan eventually bought them up. But um, and they had part part ownership in the years that I was there. We always cooperated with the uh, Japanese breeders at Sakata, which was a very good thing. It was a healthy thing. But I had the great good fortune of working for one of the last mom and pop bigger seed companies. It was still a family owned operation. They still maintained a lot of good OPs, and um, and I had the really great good fortune of working with a real dyed in the wool alfalfa breeder who really knew how to do what I now still call population breeding in which I have hinged my whole career on good, building good populations. And I'll define that more in a few minutes. But Larry Satterley learned how to breed alfalfa at, with a couple of great alfalfa breeders who were as old as the hills and knew the real, um, you know, everything had to be field tough. Boy, you grow alfalfa, it's got to be field tough. There's no fooling around with, oh, this one's fancy, and it's got a fancier leaf shape. Or Right. <laughs> Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about that. It's just got to be, it's got to be cold tolerant. It's got to put out the biomass. It's got to be healthy. There's no single gene resistances in alfalfa, so Everything is bred for what we call horizontal resistance, which we can touch on a little bit later, which is polygenic resistance. It's, it's the tough resistance that you use when you can't find the, the silver bullet of a single gene to stop something. So I, it, Larry and I spent all sorts of time in the field. I showed him what I knew about spinach. I became a spinach breeder, uh, carrot breeder and spinach breeder right off the bat. And I was showing him spinach one day, and he was a real meat and potatoes kind of guy. He didn't eat a lot of vegetables and didn't really understand them. It was alfalfa and meat and potatoes <laughs> as far as he was concerned. That was the world of agriculture. 
all of a sudden I'm showing him, you know, baby cut finished varieties one day in a baby cut trial in right there in Mount Vernon, Washington. And he finally looks up from looking at it and after I'm describing it, what we're trying to do. And he said, oh, I get it. It's alfalfa for people. <laughs> and from that day forward, we just started breeding spinach like it was alfalfa, you know? It was great. It was all population breeding. We got polygenic resistance to downy mildew. I think you've got to stop there, John, and just say, like, what when you talk about polygenic resistance, what is that? Because you mentioned it a couple of times now. Okay, I'll, I'll go to that. Uh, so, uh, and spinach is the perfect example. So spinach has uh, the number one problem with spinach, uh, the number one disease problem with spinach um, is downy mildew, common downy mildew, pernospora, farinosa uh, for espinaca. Anyway, it is, um, since it was really first identified as a problem in California in the 1950s, when there was only one kind of downy mildew, when they first uh, published on finding it to be a problem in the valleys of California for winter production of spinach, um, and why did it become a problem? It only became a problem when they started doing monoculture spinach, of course. Um, and, and those valleys, especially those coastal valleys of California, uh, like the Salinas Valley, are the perfect breeding ground for downy mildew. What they would do is they would screen the germplasm. They would find something that showed resistance, uh, complete resistance, immunity, essentially. And uh, they would breed that in. Sure enough, it would be a single gene trait, what I call a silver bullet single gene trait, which can be effective. I'm not completely against uh, single gene, what are called uh, also vertical genes. Uh, and don't think about the vertical horizontal. It only gets tricky, and I won't try to describe that. There's quite a bit written about that if you want to pursue it. Anyone listening wants to pursue it online. But the single gene trait would essentially, once you had backcrossed it into all your um, inbred lines in spinach for hybrid spinach seed production for new varieties, um, essentially everything would be identical in its type of um, all of the varieties, all of the spinach in the field would be identical for that type of immunity. And um, nature always finds a way. Nature will always... Uh, the disease will find a way to, uh, and I don't want to get into the whether it's mutating or changing, but there are genetic variations within the disease that will circumvent that resistance, and all of a sudden you'll get a horrendous outbreak of a new, what is then called a new race of the pathogen, of the disease. And so then you have to immediate, and it spreads like wildfire in those monoculture areas, there are essentially five or six counties in the United States where downy mildew is a true problem, and it's where they grow huge monocultures of, of spinach. We do get downy in other places, but primarily it's Monterey County, uh, uh, Riverside County, San Bonito County, I forget them all, but uh, Yuma County, Arizona, and that's where all of the downy is, or primarily that's where it's a huge problem. Because that's where all the spinach is produced. That's where, it, you know, something like 80% of the uh, commercial, you know, large volume spinach is grown in the United States, 80 plus. So long story short is um, you essentially set up by breeding for these single genes that stop it cold, that, that give you immunity. You're basically also breeding the pathogen to find genetic variation in the pathogen it's Darwinian evolution and it's at its finest. You're selecting for the pathogen that can outpace the resistance. And so far, uh, when I got to Christensen, we were at race six downy mildew was the new race that I had to tackle as soon as I became the spinach breeder in 1999. In, um, uh, we are now at race, depending on who you talk to out west, we're at race 17 or 18. So we've gone in 15, 16 years through another at least uh, 10 races of downy mildew. Every two to three wow. years, you have to backcross in a new resistance 
to all your stocks. And in fact, what this sets up also that's of big concern uh, to a lot of the farmers that I work with is uh, you finally find a spinach variety that really suits your conditions. All farmers, when they're looking for any kind of variety of any crop, they have to grow the crop two or they have to grow the new variety two or three years to learn how to grow that variety. You remember this from being a farmer, right, Chris? Oh, yeah. You oh, never yeah. latch on to a new variety and know how to grow it right away. It's a little bit different than the other variety you've been growing before. And you have to learn, if you're a good farmer, you have to learn how to grow it to get the maximum potential out of it. And all of a sudden, you get to know how to grow a variety for three years, and boom, the variety is gone because it didn't have enough downy mildew resistance genes to suit those six or seven counties on the West Coast. This is what farmers now, I just learned this term in January at the Organic Seed Growers Conference, one of the growers from uh, California called this the hybrid churn. Right. And it's not because it's a hybrid, it's just because they're essentially having to come up with new versions all of the time to meet this, this race race. It is the race race. You're racing to get the new resistance to the new race, the pathogen, into all of your material all of the time. Well, and if I'm a if I'm a spinach grower in California, that downy mildew resistance is is a primary trait that I'm looking for. But if I'm a if I'm a spinach farmer in southern Wisconsin, I might not need the resistance to race 14 of the of downy mildew. Exactly. I just need, you know, I need something that can perform over the winter. But when you've got that 80 percent of your spinach being grown in in six counties, those are the ones that are really going to be driving the production priorities for spinach seed. And, and that's precisely where we are today. And the good news on that is I'm my one of my main charges now at, at Johnny's is to work on spinach varieties. And I'm looking for places to test for downy mildew so I can get some good general horizontal resistance or polygenic resistance, which I'll describe next. But I do not have to have the latest races because our prime market, Johnny's does sell a little bit of spinach seed into those markets in California. And certainly we want to supply um, the spinach for the growers that are under that kind of pressure if they choose to buy seed from us. But uh, there are 3,005 counties and parishes in the United States alone. And so to gear the whole breeding program for those six is fine for some people, but I'm gearing my spinach breeding for the other 2,995 plus counties and parishes in the United States that don't have the constant pressure. Now, the polygenic resistance, or hor often called horizontal resistance, nowadays also being called, thankfully, a very good new term is durable resistance. And durable because it doesn't break down, as they say in, in the parlance of uh, the plant breeding world. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't fail when a new race of the pathogen comes along. Is something called horizontal resistance, durable resistance, where you're essentially, instead of finding a specific single disease resistance gene, you're finding a, a, a number of traits, what probably are just traits within the plant, that resist the infection, the fast uh, growth of the infection, and uh, the reproduction of the pathogen in your stock. So in other, in other words, this can be anything from cuticle waxiness of the cells or the leaf, a cell wall thickness, possibly just the biochemistry of the, of the contents of the cell that, you know, some cells are better food for the pathogen or some spinach uh, varieties within the variation of spinach. Some are probably better food sources than others, just as far as the pathogen being able to grow on it. Uh, that's one of the, the good theories, but we don't even, when we're selecting for any crop that has non-specific race specific resistance we're just doing good old trait selection does this plant get the disease when it's 
presented with the disease, when it's inoculated, when it's grown in the presence of the disease, does it get it? And essentially, how fast does it get it? And how much does it mar the spinach? Right. And in fact, we had between uh, Larry Satterley and my work at Christensen, we had stuff on a one to nine scale. We always score on a one to nine. Nine is close to no disease and one is hammered by the disease. We would have things that were often, we had selected through cycles of selection, spinach that would even under pretty heavy infestation in trial plots in Salinas, California, where we'd have sevens and eights on the, on the spectrum of resistance. Uh, and that was from polygenic resistance. And that's what I'm still doing with a number of pathogens in my breeding now. So I'm curious, why, why are they still breeding for race resistance in spinach then? Why not? Why hasn't everybody gone over to this polygenic resistance? Because, well, I've got a nice postscript on this of some people that are finally thinking that way. But um, the, the, the short answer is, it's not complete resistance and the farmers, especially under that heavy duty um, uh, monocropping that they do there have really gotten used to complete immunity. They've just gotten used to the spinach not having any. In fact, when I'd have growers in my trials in Salinas, when I'd have good seven and eight on a nine point scale, for Downey, I'd say, look, here's my new, here's my new test hybrid that's got pretty darn good resistance, high level, what I would call a high level of resistance. And they'd bend down and they'd look at it and they'd, you know, spend a couple of minutes and they go, wait a minute, I found some Downey on this one. There it is. That ain't resistant. That's field tolerance, they'd say. They'd use the T word, which I don't even use that word. <laughs> but anyway, um, to them, field tolerance was kind of, they'd say it out of the side of their mouth and they'd like spit it out. Like that's just field tolerance. We want real, we're paying for real resistance here. We don't want second fiddle. If we can find a little bit of downy, but the truth of the matter was compared to some of their every two or three years when it would, when the resistance would break down, they'd have polka dot fields of spinach that they'd have to, they'd have that were plow downs. And, um, so, and certainly all that spinach goes over sorting lines and they could pick a little bit of downy out and they still get a crop. The postscript to that is a friend of mine, and I won't say his name so he can remain anonymous, but a friend of mine was actually a forage breeder in California, was recently approached by the spinach industry, Spinach Growers Association, I believe it's called. Anyway, they ba basically approached this, this plant breeder and they said, could you breed us something that has horizontal resistance, has good, strong horizontal resistance, is an OP, and we can produce our own seed because there are a lot of growers in California who are basically getting tired of the hybrid churn. And I was fascinated by that, the fact that they had come that far. Because I, I think if I had approached them and told them how I was doing it, you know, 10, 14, 12, 14, 16 years ago, uh, they, they weren't quite ready for that yet. So that, that, I think that's very indicative how the world, how the world does change. So you stated out Christensen doing, doing carrot and spinach breeding. And beef, beef charred uh, spinach carrots. And in fact, um, the best part of my whole time at Christensen was learning a number one, I could do that horizontal work and it really worked. And even though California wasn't ready for it and B what was really good was uh, Christensen had all of those OPs and I had my hand in maintaining OPs. And uh, that's where I really learned how to both with the influence of Larry Satterley who was the alfalfa breeder who there, they don't have hybrids in alfalfa. I think they're fooling around now with hybrids and alfalfa, it's silliness as far as I'm concerned, but, and Larry would agree, but um, uh, Larry and I just looked at all of the crops there that were OPs and said, this is how you maintain a good OP that's genetically diverse, that has good um, uh, adaptive advantage, um, and is selected to the point where it's uniform enough to satisfy most people's needs. And that was a that was really where I learned how to do the plant breeding that I now do every day. 
after a number of years at Christensen, I was just, I was burned out working in, uh, you know, uh, yet we weren't, the big seed companies really weren't addressing, uh, uh, were not addressing organic at all. And again, it was this pull to be back with my, with my peeps, you know, with the real organic farmers. I still had plenty of friends who were organic farmers, but I wasn't getting to work with them. So that's when, over a matter of some changes there in my life, Matthew Dillon and I got together and we said, Matthew Dillon was working for Abundant Life Seed Foundation in Port Townsend, Washington. I was living in Bellingham, Washington. And that's when Matthew and I got together uh, after we'd had a really successful seed growers conference at OSA, the very first one, which was still under the mantle of Abundant Life. And Matthew and I said, you know what, we need to shape this organization into something new, something that really is not just a preservation organization for heirlooms, something that's not just teaching backyard skills, all of which are very important for seed saving, but something that addresses the need for quantities, good commercial quantities and quality of high grade certified organic seeds. Start training organic farmers how to grow seed. I know that when I was farming, there were actually seed companies, you know, because we were required to do the organic seed search, right? Right. For, you know, equivalent varieties available. And and there were seed companies that I simply told my organic certifier, they don't count, right? The the seed, the quality is such crap that, exactly. that I... I even if even if they're saying they've got the same variety, it's not the same variety. I'm not going to name names, but but there no. were definitely three or four companies that that we had dealt with that we just eliminated from from even looking at their catalogs. And it was both the quality of seed per se, right? The actual quality of that physical thing, the seed. Did it germinate? Did it get up and run fast? Which is crucial. Any good farmer knows they've got to have top-notch seed, just the quality of the seed itself. And then, of course, there was the variety, uh, the varietal uh, trueness to type and the the well-maintained, if it was, in fact, an OP, whether it was well-maintained and if that Detroit dark red was really a good Detroit dark red. Exactly. And we did a trial at the time. One of the first things we did at or, uh, Organic Seed Alliance was we had an OP carrot trial of all the OPs we could get. And we had like four versions of, of Scarlet Nance carrot. Carrot I'm still working with right now. We're, Johnny's is producing a crop this year of well-maintained, beautiful Scarlet Nance that Johnny's used to always sell that they bought actually from Mount Christensen. But um, we did a trial where we compared four versions of Scarlet Nance. And if we took photographs and we showed those for, you know, slides as slides for years, because that there was the good, the bad, and the ugly of Scarlet Nance. And the difference was absolutely night and day between a well-maintained strain, the good old Christensen strain, and the, uh, and the sloppy ones where there wasn't any uh, actual trait maintenance, genetic maintenance, and selection thereof. That's certainly something that I saw when I was working in seed preservation. When you grow out seeds, things change, right? It's not a static system. It's not something where you can keep it like it was, as Edward Abbey liked to say about the of the desert Southwest, which also you can't keep it like it was because it was, it's a living system and where you grow it, when you grow it. Um, I was just, I was actually just reading in your book on, um, you were talking about lettuce seed and how lettuce seed takes a long time to come to maturity. So it's important to plant it really early, but essentially if you, if you do that, if you plant early, you're selecting for lettuce that performs well in the spring and you're selecting yes. for early bolting and early maturity of the seed, which isn't actually what you want if you're a farmer, if you're growing lettuce. It's what you want if you're growing lettuce seed. But I think it's one of the things that, that is a, it's a, it's a big misconception when we start looking at, at open pollinated varieties and, and maintenance is that you know, seed saving is not an amateur sport and you really have to be aware of everything that's going into that selection process. And I think it's one of the things that happens with the, 
as you've described it, as the drift in varieties. You know, when you've got four different Scarlet Dots varieties and they're all so completely different, that's because they've been grown under different selection pressures, whether those were intentional or unintentional. Very nicely said, Chris. Yes. And there's always, there's always two things going on. There's always the natural selection of your environment. And it's going to favor some plants over others. So some plants are going to, whether they die or not, whether they're fecund, fecundity means ability to be uh, fruitful in procreation. Do they make a lot of seeds? Right. And so sometimes they don't even make it to the flowering stage or they have some abnormality that forms such poor flowers or whatever that they contribute very little to the population. So they're gone. And then... Some plants are just in carrots, the biggest, gnarliest roots in the population, the ones that look, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better term, the gnarliest, the, uh, the most adventitious roots, all sorts of things. Those are the ones that tend to produce more flowers, more, more pollen, and more seeds. So if you're not roguing them out, the population's going to drift to the big, gnarly ugly carrots, tough carrots. So you have to constantly be selecting. And, uh, and this lettuce is a great example. You mentioned that. I'll have to say one of the things I learned Frank Morton in his lettuce breeding, and most of your listeners know who Frank is, and his amazing life of being a lettuce breeder. Frank at Wild Garden Seeds. Wild out, Garden out Seeds in Philomath, Oregon. Yes. Right. And, uh, and Frank, of course, sells his seed to a lot of companies from Johnny's to High Mowing to everybody. And uh, because we all love some of his varieties, are just so phenomenal. And he, and he does a lively business through his own catalog. Frank is the one who really informed that lettuce chapter in my book about getting that lettuce out as early as possible. Because, in fact, especially in a place like the Willamette Valley where he is, he doesn't have as long of a season as if he was down in the Sac Valley in California where they grow a lot of lettuce seed. So he's got to be able to get it out there as early as possible because he doesn't want to, if he plants it too late, then he really has to select for early bolting or he'll never mature seed in time. So part of him being the samurai warrior on lettuce is he gets it out as early as possible so he can constantly select against true early bolting and then he has to know exactly the time where he's got to start letting the bolt or else he's not going to mature a, a good quality seed crop that jumps out of the ground as vigorous is uh, juicy, nice, big lettuce seeds, right? Right. So that's the, that is the art of being a good seed grower. And that always becomes coupled with your ability to select. And as Bill Tracy says, once you grow seed, You are a plant breeder, whether you'd like it or not, because you're either managing natural selection, helping it along, which we all do, but you're also then having to apply at some level, even if you're unconsciously doing it, you're doing some selection uh, in your plot for a certain percentage of those plants that you, hopefully you're actually selecting for the ones you consciously don't like or consciously don't fit the, the, the idiotype of the, of the variety, but even if you're not trying, you're doing selection by favoring some over others. You know, it was actually one of the really important lessons that I got out of, out of my involvement with holistic management and actually working on a ranch out West and, and observing and paying attention to this process over the years. I've really come to believe that they, you're always managing. It's just whether you're doing it consciously or not. You know, it's are you actually doing it to get a defined outcome and and making choices that help move you in that direction? But like you said, by the simple fact of interacting with a seed production or interacting with your environment in any way at all, you're managing that environment. And it's the same thing, whether you're doing employees or farm business. I mean, you can if you if you don't know where you're going and what it is that you're trying to get at every step of the way, why am I doing this thing this way? Yeah, you're still you're still managing. You're just not consciously engaged in the process and you're going to get results that don't match up with what you want. Beautifully said, Chris, beautifully. And it does. It is a universal truth across all aspects of 
of agriculture and, and farming and all aspects of life, really, right? And the more you, and the more, and I, this is what you don't see when you first meet really good plant breeders, is you don't see how intensively they're managing the, the crop so well that it doesn't even look like they're managing it. Right. But they're selecting, they're selecting from the time, based on the timing of when they're seeding, based on the thinning of the crop and the flats. You're definitely doing selection there, boy. If you don't take advantage of your selection, I heard on your podcast with Daniel Brebois, you know, him talking about selecting in the flats. And by God, he's right. That's very incredibly important. You got that chance to select for good, vigorous, hardy, jump out of the ground seedlings right from day one. And you have a hundred times during the season to be able to say, you know what? That plant's just not up to snuff. It's doing something I don't like. I'm getting rid of it. Or you might like a plant this week and then next week it doesn't look so good. You get it out. And that's why you also always grow big enough populations of any seed crop, whether it's in, you know, my spinach seed crop that I'm growing to seed in my garden right now here in Belfast, Maine, I'm kicking, I kicked two new plants out last night with going out to look at it that weren't obvious that I didn't like them 10 days ago. Last time I did a little selection on this population. So it's a constant thing. And it's all about uh, attention and knowing the crop you're working with and, and seeing the, the end goal and seeing where you're trying to shape this. So, John, on that universal truth, I think that's a good spot for us to stop and take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. Love it. Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. Through 23 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed in intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges organic growers face, and they combine that with the comprehensive of understanding of soil and plant science and an intuitive comprehension that often has Carl and his crew sticking their noses into a handful of compost and inhaling deeply as though they were sampling a fine brandy. Vermont Compost is the real thing, built on consistency instead of glitz. Like the donkey on their logo, Vermont Compost potting soils aren't glitzy or glamorous. They're steadfast and consistent, stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from a few cubic centimeters of soil. Oh, by the way, the donkeys are the real thing, and you get a little bit of donkey manure in every batch of Vermont Compost potting soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com This week, the Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by you, our listeners. And the nice thing about that is that I don't need to go on and on about it because the fact that you're here probably means that you already think the Farmer to Farmer podcast is kind of cool. New this week, we've put in motion three ways that you can help the podcast at FarmerToFarmerPodcast.com slash donate. First, you can become a patron of the show by setting up a monthly donation through Patreon, which is kind of like Kickstarter for ongoing projects. It's a great way to support the behind-the-scenes effort that you don't hear, from research and scheduling to editing and getting the show online. Or you can do a one-time donation through PayPal, which would also be awesome. Third, if you use the Amazon.com link on farmer farmerpodcastcom Amazon kicks a percentage of what you spend back to the show, and it won't cost you a penny more. Go to farmer farmerpodcastcom slash donate for more information and all of the relevant links. Thank you so much for your support. All right. Welcome back to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. We're talking to John DeBazio from Johnny Selected Seeds and a whole bunch of other places before that on um, that really lead up to a very interesting background. And, and John, we were talking about your work at organic seed Alliance um, and, and, you know, doing selection and management. And I think it's one of the things you did at organic seed Alliance. that was really interesting was working on participatory plant breeding, you know, really farmer led and farmer based plant breeding. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and how that worked at a practical level? Yes, I, I would love to because it's really instructive some of the things we learned by getting into this, not really knowing what we would find as we got into participatory plant breeding. So Organic Seed Alliance, our first mission was to, to teach people how to grow high quality certified organic seed for all the reasons we've already discussed that are 
so important to farmers. If you're going to have organically grown seed, you don't ever want to say, well, it's not as good as the regular conventional stuff that I can buy. So I'd rather buy the conventional because it ain't as good. So we were going to change that. I helped to change that as much as we could forever. But once we got onto farms with farmers, we really learned two different things. Here's kind of the split. And I'll take them one at a time. We learned that all farmers naturally, um, if they're really interested in it, they want to jump right in and not only do the, the roguing and the maintenance and, and, and really learning about that if they're the inspired seed farmers, uh, but oftentimes they have their own breeding projects and they want something new. And the best of the farmers often that we interacted with um, would have little projects up their sleeve that had happened. Either they had an older OP that they uh, just wanted to improve and adapt to their system that had got, it had strayed or drifted, as we say, genetic drift, and they wanted to bring it back to uh, its former glory or a new glory of, of being adapted to their system, which is what it's really about. Or they'd have some happy accident where they'd have an errant cross that may have happened between two different varieties on their farm, and they would say, wow, I'm getting some neat stuff. When the hybrid zucchini, this is the case of Dark Star Zucchini, Bill Reynolds had uh, his black yield zucchini, and it had crossed with um, Dark Star, and boom, the rest is, is history. So they would have interesting material to work on, and they would have a vision of something uh, that was better than what might be available currently from the regular commercial sources of seed. And that really got interesting. And we realized that was a whole basis as we were learning about participatory plant breeding, where we could go beyond just producing seed and start to do on-farm plant breeding. Um, so we'll talk about PPB in the purest sense, but the other thing that was interesting, and I will say this about OSA, at OSA, I always had a certain amount of my own breeding projects, and because OSA didn't own our own land, we'd go ahead and say, hey, we've got um, uh, this particular chicory breeding uh, objective that we want to start. We'd start it at a local farm, and sure enough, the farmer would get interested and, you know, look at the plots and say, wow, well, this is a crop I'd like to get more into. And pretty soon, then we'd also infect the farmers into wanting to help with, with maybe a, a breeder-directed crop that wasn't participatory plant breeding to begin with, but then the farm would come in. But the result in both cases would be participatory plant breeder, where you have a farmer who really knows the crop, knows the market, knows their needs culturally and market-wise for that crop, and then you'd have the breeder who'd have their own ideas. They'd have some of the tricks of the trade of how you do progeny selection or something like that, or how, how we most easily make crosses or make sure we mix the population. And between the two, the farmer directed thing and the, and the breeder directed, you realized it could really be a true collaborative thing, but always with being very mindful of what the great participatory plant breeders from around the world, especially those who worked in, in low input systems in the global south with the lessons they had learned about letting the farmers be the final judge, be the final arbiters of what is it that they're trying to, to get at. So that was always really good because it forged relationships with farmers that I still have those good, strong relationships to this day. Some of them are now growing some seed for Johnny's and they're growing seed happily for a dozen different companies, which is great. And, uh, and they really are empowered plant breeders. So, John, can you tell us a little bit about how participatory plant breeding, which you also called PPB, actually works? I mean, just at a fundamental rubber meets the road fashion? Yes, sure. Let's do it that way. So um, you grow out a population, something they're working on, as I've described, something that might have been their happy accident of cross. And you go out and you start looking at it with them and you say, hey, what is it really after? And they say, wow, if I could just have a, a very good, strong bush. In the case of uh, the Dark Star Zucchini project with Bill Reynolds, it was, I want a strong uh, central leader of a bush 
I want something that produces zucchinis four or six weeks longer than any hybrid does, which Bill had been selecting for, and in fact, he got. I can't have any vining. I can't have it too busy, as Bill always called it. Uh, that means too many stems. You know, when, sometimes when you grow older zucchinis, it's like what Bill also calls bushers. And you're, you're reaching in trying to find the zucchinis, whereas modern zucchinis are nice, open habit. There are not that many leaves. You can easily reach in. The, the zucchinis don't get scarred in pulling them out of there. You don't get scarred as far as all the scratches on your arms as you're harvesting them. So Bill had very, uh, very concrete ideas of what he wanted in this zoo, and he wasn't really getting it. So my role then was to say, well, Bill, let's, well, let's do self-pollinations on his, his, you know, up to 50 plants of the best ones. You have a half acre plot here, go out and flag the 50 best plants, self-pollinate them. And then we're going to start a next year. We'll do a progeny row selection thing. By the way, this technique has been beautifully written about, um, by, uh, by the good graces of Jared Zeistro at Organic Seed Alliance and, and help with me. And we put out a couple of publications on how to do this. And they are free downloads at seedalliance.org if anybody's interested. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes too. So you'll be able to find that easily. Once Bill and I started this process and he uh, started to self plant, it really... The neat thing about that was it got him to really think about and crystallize more than he ever had before, because all of a sudden he was identifying all of the specific plants that had all of the traits he and I reviewed. Um, once we uh, saved the seed that first year off those 50 plants that had been self-pollinated um, and grew out these progeny rows, again, which is very nicely delineated in those publications at OSA, um, we really started to compare and contrast what this population could look at. But all of the time, he was the guiding light of, it's gotta be able to germinate quickly and get its roots down to the water we have here in Northern California, which was, he's on basically a, a floodplain, and there's always water three or four deep, feet deep in the soil. But it stops raining in May, he has no irrigation in that floodplain, and he relies on groundwater to mature a crop. So there would be all of these aspects of his knowledge of the land, of the climate, and of the crop and how it interacted with that, that were really um, informed that breeding. That were things that I could never have thought about for that particular set of parameters. That's what makes participatory plant breeding at its best when it really is farmer directed. That's what makes it powerful. I was just there to coach, essentially. I really like that idea. Is, is that something that you've continued now that you've moved to Johnny Selected Seeds? Are you still working on participatory plant breeding projects? It, it, it's funny. In a certain sort of way, I am now. I am doing it now with two or three of uh, of my assistants. Who uh, w only one, uh, Sam Mudge, is my assistant now, but also uh, Steve Rodriguez is a a uh, great young man who's interested in chicory breeding and things like that. He's, he's growing the crop. And so on the side and a little bit on our own time, you know, we're out there. I'm, I'm getting them to be involved in doing the selection and directing it. I want to see what they can come up with in, in some of these crops. So it's, it's very fun just on the, on the research farm, right in Albion, Maine, but also in my seed work where I'm growing, um, uh, onion seed and carrot seed with some of the growers out in the Pacific Northwest that I've worked with for years, some kale seed with Nash Uber in, in Washington. We're still, we're, we're definitely still, that's still part of the ball game because we're still doing, getting the final stages on some good OPs. And so it, it really is PPB. It's not as intensive as I was doing at OSA, but certainly, um, OSA continues to do that work and Lori McKenzie's doing it. So thank goodness it's ongoing. Now the participatory plant breeding seems like it's almost always going to lead to open pollinated varieties, which don't seem like they're that common anymore in a lot of crops. I mean, you know, where, where hybrids work, 
which, you know, hybrid lettuce doesn't, is not really a thing, but you know, when you look at, when you look at modern commercial varieties, spinach, tomatoes, uh, peppers, carrots, beets, it seems like most of what's out there, at least that are really top notch varieties are, are hybrids and, and not open pollinated. That's correct. Yes. And so, um, this is a bit of, a, this is a bit of a shift and I think there is a shift going on in appreciation for good OPs now, more than there ever has been. You know, remember, I've been a card-carrying member of Seed Savers Exchange since 1984 and been an OP advocate long before I learned how to breed hybrids, and I've bred hybrids throughout my career as well as OPs. Uh, And certainly answering your question, yeah, the PPB thing really leads to having a dynamic population that's adaptive and and changing on your farm is the is the best of uh, uh, of what PPB has to offer because you really are managing it just like you'd manage uh, your breeding herd if you were a livestock uh, breeder or or you know or as all of our ancestors have managed all their crops since the dawn of agriculture. So the OP versus, first of all, let me give you a little bit of background. I'm currently at Johnny's. The really wonderful thing is I've been directed to both clean up and improve, and in fact, breed new non-hybrid varieties and a number of crops that are traditionally, uh, at least in the past 20 years, have have gone the way of, of being largely hybrid as far as new varieties being released. Um, and all of the crops I work with, and most of what I'll say now for your, for your listeners who understand this, uh, and I think most of them do are interested in seeds enough to listen to this whole deal, it's I work on cross-pollinated species. So there's the, the major breakdown in, in crop uh, reproduction is there are crossers that are naturally outcrossing, and there are self-pollinated crops. And the selfers tend to be easier to maintain as non-hybrids or OPs uh, because they naturally self-pollinate. And so they're not crossing and shape-shifting all of the time, if you will. There's less heterozygosity in them, to use the fancy term for genetic variability. And the selfers are also, some of the selfers, such as small grains, lettuce, peas, beans, um, those are generally not made into hybrids. You, there are really no hybrid peas that I know of or hybrid beans. You know, there are new people make crosses with them to produce and breed new true breeding varieties. But if you're buying seed, even if it originated from a cross, but it's true breeding and is um, not an F1 hybrid, then, of course, it is uh, by default an OP, right? I think everybody gets that. Right. So I work with, uh, and there are a couple exceptions, uh, tomatoes, and peppers, eggplants are generally thought of as selfers, though the more I've worked with all three, um, they, they tend to cross a lot more than people think, especially in biologically rich systems where there are lots of pollinating insects. But those are, those are cases of... of predominantly selfing crops that they have used to make uh, that the plant, the plant industry has, the seed industry has gone to hybrids on. And there are a number of reasons why hybrids were done. So F1 hybrids are, um, are really uh, a, a wonderful breeding strategy. If you want to fix traits, if you want to have real stability in the variety, especially in crossers, real stability from year to year of what the variety looks like, the phenotype, right? What you see is what you get, that's the phenotype. And um, uh, you can get a degree of uniformity in hybrids that in a lot of crossers in OPs, you, you never quite get that level of uniformity. I've always contested you can get really darn close, and I've seen it in my own work, we get what I think is enough uniformity for pretty much anybody in an OP, but uh, it is easier to lock it in. The other great advantage of hybrids is, especially if you're dealing with those single gene traits that we explored in that 
in the disease resistance vertical versus horizontal. If you're if you're trying to lock in a series of single gene traits, or even fix any trait, even if it's polygenic in some cases, you can do that through the inbreeding process where you make parental lines, what are called inbred lines. Um, and by making inbred lines, you can fix traits. So if you cross uh, a a tomato A times tomato B inbred, you always get burpee big boy. You know, it just comes out, you know, beautiful uh, cookie cutter. As, but you do have to do, you still have to maintain inbred lines. But inbreeding men, in, inbred lines by definition are much more inbred, so there's less variation. They're much easier to maintain. And part of the allure of hybrids for the seed industry in the early days of hybrids was a, you could fix traits faster in inbreds than you could through population breeding. And B, you could then get the package out faster. And then C, you would, because you kept those parental types to yourself in your own coffers, your own vaults, um, you were the only one that could make that hybrid. So you had essentially a proprietary thing without any legal uh, without any necessity of a legal key. So, John, I think it's really interesting. I mean, you actually just you you listed three things. There's only one of those that commonly comes up in hybrid bashing conversations, which is that you know it gives the seed company ultimate control over the genetics. Um, those other two are really interesting. How important are those? Uh, well, they're very in the modern world. That whole being able to fix the traits and get a new variety out quickly, and being able to maintain all those stocks um, as as inbreds is well. Let's put it this way: the the seed industry has evolved, so that's the pinnacle of how they do business. So it's it's part and parcel. There's nothing, and this is putting no value judgment on it. It's a slick system. And it works, and it does produce a really good product for any of – I'm sure all of your listeners have favorite hybrids that they love, that they say, gee, I just, you know, uh, uh, big beef, I just can't find a, an OP uh, or an heirloom that quite has all the characteristics of big beef tomato. I know I hear that from a lot of my friends who grow tomatoes. So it's, it's worked for a number of years. Yeah, I mean, it works until until you really start to count on a variety. And, you know, this comes back to that hybrid churn idea that we talked about earlier. You know, I mean, I remember we lost over the years on my farm several varieties that were cornerstones of our operation. I mean, I'm thinking particularly of a hybrid buffalo tomato, which was our, our number one yeah. greenhouse tomato. And I'm thinking of, um, of Sweetie Number 6 Melon from Cicada, which was – really the only melon that we could that we ever grew successfully at Rock Spring Farm year in and year out. And then all of a sudden, both of those just, they up and disappeared. And I know we lived in terror that Bolero Carrot was going to go off the market. What's going on there in those decisions that companies are making about those varieties? Even though we know that the diversified market farm in organic produce, and we're talking vegetables now, of course, even though we know how big it's gotten and how much bigger it is than it used to be and how many darn farmers there are across North America, U.S. and Canada, mm -hmm. that think like us and that are growing a lot of these things, even though we know all about that and we think that's huge compared to, uh, to certainly what it used to be, remember, even if every organic farmer in North America buys a pound of Thai E spinach seed every year, that still is not anywhere near the kind of volume of seed that the big boys are buying. And so it often comes down to a pure and simple, it's just not enough volume of seed for the big seed production, uh, the, what we call production research companies, the the companies that most farmers don't even know the names of the big production research companies because they're the ones who have the breeders and they produce the seed and then they sell to the Osbournes or the Johnnies or the Seegers or the um, 
Rups or the whoever farmers out there are buying their seeds from. Almost yeah, every retail that. seed company is buying from these breeding companies, essentially. That's correct. That's okay. correct. And Johnny's, for instance, is a real anomaly in the industry because we produce more seed than most distribution companies because we've actively, because Rob Johnston started breeding at Johnny's years ago. So we had this great uh, wealth of our own material. Plus, Rob always had a had a thing about producing some of the unusual things that, that he couldn't get otherwise through the normal seed channels. So Johnny's being both a producer of seed and a broker of seed is a very unusual place. Most seed companies are, are either one or the other. So those big companies, uh, I'll, I'll add a, a couple more to your list. Well, Thai E spinach, I just said, that was dropped in the past year. I'm my number one breeding objective at Johnny's now is to a placement for Thai. And um, Cobra Onion, how about that one? Cobra's been a drop for several years now. So there's a couple of seed companies that still must have, they must have had a stash. So there's still a little trickle of Cobra out there, but Cobra's gone. And the, so the volume of Cobra sold, the most popular organic, at least from diversified organic farms, most popular onion in North America, gone because the volume wasn't big enough to uh, satisfy in terms of sales for the big production research companies. So is that something that Johnny's, it sounds like, is working to address? I mean, you're, you're breeding a replacement for Taiyi. I assume you're doing something with, with Culper Onions, because that's something that's in your background as well. How does Johnny's make that work from a business model standpoint? Well, first and foremost, we know that a certain amount of our Best OPs are, are really good sellers. Scarlet Nance Carrot for Johnny was always a very strong, powerful seller. Rhubarb Chard for Johnny, very, I mean, amazing amounts of rely on good old rhubarb chard. So I'm cleaning up. We're going to have our own, our own version of, uh, of a red chard that we hope to be the best on the market because rhubarb tends to bolt a little bit easier than it should. So those things uh, make perfect sense for a company like Johnny Staff to be a good version of. There's no ifs, ands, and buts. And certainly Thai spinach, everyone knows how important Thai spinach is. Anybody who's ever grown spinach knows how great a variety that is. And so that's uh, immediately that was boom at the top of my list because not only can we then have, you know, if I'm successful, when I'm successful, I should say, well, we have something that can suit that unique niche that Tai is that's really different from the from the normal uh, production spinach that's grown in those six counties in uh, in the in the west coast of the United States. But not only that, but once I produce a breed, a good OP Tai E, we never have to worry about the hybrid churn anymore. We don't have to worry about one of the big distributors of spinach seed dropping the variety because we will be in charge of the stock seed. We'll maintain it. We'll produce it with good organic growers out in the Pacific Northwest where you grow high quality spinach seed. And it's a done deal. We produce it and we'll never have to worry about, oh my God, are they going to drop Bolero carrot? What if there is a shortage of Bolero carrot? What if, they, what if, and we've been reassured by the parent company that produces Bolero that they're not dropping it, but you know, things happen. We're always looking at other carrots that could be in that slot of Bolero. And honestly, for full disclosure, I don't think, I think anybody would guess knowing my history with carrots, I'm breeding a, uh, I've just been making crosses to uh, come up with something that's, in that Bolero class, hopefully we'll still always have Bolero because it really is, man, that is a workhorse. That's, that's the definition of a good carrot right there. That's a, definitely a definition of a workhorse. That thing grows under all sorts of different environments. It grows in different season slots. It's, I'm still eating them from last year, and it's the 23rd of May as we record this. I've still got some I'm pulling out of storage. Hey, there's nothing better than that. But I want to have something that if there ever was just a crop failure or a shortage, we'd have a Bolero carrot or a substitute thereof. And we'd be in charge of our own seed productions. There are a lot of people at Johnny's who really want to see that happen. Certainly a lot of the sales staff, because they know 
what a bummer it is when their good growers call up and say, geez, I can't have Tyee. What the heck am I going to do? And we're looking for options. We have some short-term options, but the long-term option is for me, me to breed one that we can maintain. Okay. So, I mean, we talked about some of the advantages there of, of OPs and ways that you can work with those open pollinated crops, but you know, and I came out of the heirloom world and I, you know, I spent a couple of years managing the, the seed production at Seed Savers and I got into farming largely because of my interest in, uh, in heirloom seeds and, and that the preservation of that. But, you know, when I was farming, I really had a bias towards hybrids because, man, did they, they just performed so often so much better than the open pollinated varieties. Can you speak to that a little bit and with, with your breeding work and your perspective? I'm glad we got to this because this is the place we need to be to summarize this uh, once and for all. You have to realize, and again, in the crops that have been uh, largely produced as hybrid varieties for the past 30 to 50 years now in vegetables, um, and especially the ones where all of the modern breeding is basically going towards that, um, is there advantage in making hybrids? Yes, I've already stated that. Uh, and you do get uniformity. You do get directed breeding for certain traits. You do get, um, you know, that stability of traits, that year in, year out stability, which is very important for farmers. And then you do get the hybrid vigor. There's no doubt that their hybrid vigor heterosis is a real thing. Uh, but what the only reason you can't compare OPs and hybrids at this point, and we're, you know, this is changing actually, as we speak, it's been changing for 10 or 15 years with good uh, breeders working on OPs again, is the fact that once the large companies that do the plant breeding and m almost all plant breeding comes from from uh, large research production seed companies and less and less from universities. And that's really what it's been until we've had the groundswell of, of young independent plant breeders. But when you consider those companies made the switch in broccoli, it was in the seventies and tomatoes. It was in the sixties in cabbage. It was really in the late seventies, eighties. You know, you pick your crop. We can pick the error when the switch happened. When that switch happened, first of all, there was no more new breeding for OPs in those crops. And the maintenance of the OPs that were still in existence, that still had demand, were not. The maintenance started to take second priority to the hybrids. All of the good PhD plant breeders that those places were hiring to do the breeding they put all of the energy into the new product that was giving them market share. And the OPs became the redheaded stepchild of the seed industry. And so what happens when you ignore something and you're not doing that good genetic maintenance and selection, and not to mention new breeding in those backgrounds, all of a sudden it goes to hell in a handbasket. And so whenever I'd hear people all those years say, well, geez, the OP is just not anywhere near as good as the hybrid. It's like, you're not just comparing apples and oranges, considering how much energy goes into those two things. You're comparing kumquats to watermelons. There's no comparison. How <laughs> could you compare them to? So the fact now once, and there were some notable exceptions in that, by the way, I'll give one example, you know, um, Red Core Chantenay Carrot, which we're now working on at Johnny's, which is one of my favorite carrots, is starting to be grown on the West Coast in amazing uh, amount of growers are starting to grow it for restaurants and food processing. You know, if you're making kimchi and you put carrots in your kimchi or cortito or all of those kind of processed foods or any kind of Annie's processed foods, that sort of thing, not to mention restaurants and any kind of food service. There's no better color, uh, carrot than red core champagne. It produces a big root. There's, if you're going to peel it, it's minimal peeling for the amount of production because they, you can grow those things as big as a, a, a horse's leg, and they're still tender and delicious and not woody at all. 
red core, they, they've never been able to breed a hybrid to replace red core in the Pacific Northwest. The only reason we still have red core after all these years and it's been well maintained by my former company there, Al Christensen and Al Cicada, is because it's the number one processing carrot in conventional processing. Because they, they put it, it goes into every can of uh, Campbell soup or Jenny Moore beef stew is Red Core Chantonet. So now we have the whole organic community buying that, and there's no hybrid that can match good old OP Red Core. Why? Well, it's because they maintained it. They selected it. They, they kept a good strain of it. The same is true with Detroit Short Top Beat, which is still the number one processing beat uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And I had I worked with, when I was a beet breeder out there, many of the larger commercial growers had grow trials on their property. And they say, here's another informative thing where they knew they got the best strain, well-maintained strain from the Al Christensen company. They say, I only buy my short top seed out of a Christensen bag. I won't buy it unless I... I can break the seal in a Christensen bag. So that's the power of main. Those are two examples of ones that were kept up, maintained, and they were out competing the, the hybrids. So I think we can do that in a number of, a number of crops. Now I'm not, I am not anti-hybrid at all. I'm in fact, in my spinach breeding, I'm, uh, hopefully I'm putting together some hybrid combinations that might be the next tie That'll be fine. We can maintain our own. There's nothing inherently evil about uh, hybrids. And in fact, they're, it's really cool for putting together those traits quickly, as I've already said. Uh, but there's also the thing about OPs is, and the fact that you never quite get quite the uniformity, though we do in some cases, we had very good uniformity. I think uh, for some reason, the seed business they latched onto that uniformity thing really early on with hybrid corn, and it certainly was important, and it certainly was much more uniform than all of the varied OP corns that were out there back in the day when they were first making corn hybrids. Um, but, you know, they've oversold the, the um, usefulness of that to some degree. I meet more and more farmers when I, I always go to farmer's markets, it's my lifeblood to keep me in touch with what farmers are doing with the vegetables, right? And right. I see it time and time again where they found some good OP and I say, gee, you know, you're not getting quite the uniformity. There's some variation there. Oh, we don't, it doesn't matter. We have some, some of our customers will buy this grade out of this. Some will buy others. And, and if it's a really good, like a red core Chantenay, the, you know, it's almost as uniform as a hybrid. It's right there. It's in the pocket. So uh, in, in our work with chicory, early on in, in the chicory breeding that I did at Organic Seed Alliance and some of the good chicory populations they have there, our, our growers who were doing the testing of it with us, they wanted to cut it and take it to market because all of a sudden they had a cold, hardy vegetable long past the, uh, the season for lettuce. And in the Pacific Northwest, they were selling the chicories easy till Christmas when lettuce was nowhere to be found. And they were pretty wild and woolly variation in those populations. We were getting nice shape and nice form. And I'd say to my growers, I'd say, wow, you can sell that. And they'd say, oh, no problem. People like that variation. We don't have to worry about it. It's not an issue. So I think as people get closer to their customers, as all of us find out that in variation is in fact life and is uh, beauty that, uh, and is adaptiveness and genetic variation that's meaningful as far as uh, resiliency in the environment, I think when all of those things are put together, people are starting to see that as a value again. They're seeing it just like they're seeing the variation on their farms and in their systems and in the ecosystems, they're seeing the validity of how that is, is the true robustness and resilience of the system. Nice, John. With that, let's yeah. turn to the lightning rounds. Okay. So, John, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Or maybe oh. I should ask, what's your favorite tool on the seed farm? Um, 
you know, my first, my first aunt, my kind of smart alecky answer, because everybody knows I'm a pencil nerd, old fashioned, sharpen your own pencil. You know, pencil is definitely one of the tools, but I think really for me, uh, I have to say with more thought, it's really my eyes. I have to be out there as a plant breeder. I'm looking at my crop. I'm interpreting. It's, it's really all of my senses, Chris. It's my senses. That's my tool. I got to taste it. I've got to look at it. I've got to smell it. I've got to see how it's doing. I, I have to see how it's evolving through the season. Because like I said earlier, I'm selecting over cycles of selection, both in generational time, but in through cycles of the season while the crop's out there. So I've got to see it. But that's where the pencil comes into uh, good use, too. I'm always carrying around a clipboard, and I want to, you know, I'm pretty nerdy about taking notes on the stuff that are, that's important and, and being able to compare those notes through the season and look back on my handwritten notes in the field on a good old clipboard to say, oh, now I know what was happening with that particular population. And what's your favorite crop to grow? You know, it's really become, um, I think we get the most kick out of uh, chicory at this point. And I'll describe which chicories I'm talking about for many of your listeners who may not know. But chicory is so fun because it, it really is a shape-shifting crop. There's a lot of genetic variation in it. Uh, when I talk about chicory, what I'm talking about is really most of my work is in the what are called the, the Varigata de Casalfranco, excuse my Italiano, it's not so good, but uh, Varigata de Casalfranco and Varigata de Lucia, they're more of the loose leaf chicories, they're not a, a tight head like a radicchio. I'm really talking about Chicorium and Tebus, which is um, uh, not the endive and escarole, the other chicories, which that chicory, uh, talk about shape shifters, everything from Italian dandelion to Belgian endive, to radicchio, to these Casalfrancos and Lucias, to Treviso. Uh, they're all what I classify as, in general, as chicory. But we like those loosely either Treviso crosses. They give us some head at the end, but they have a lot of outer leaves. Kind of, uh, well, the Casalfrancos, it's really a well-y, well-grown one. Looks kind of like a butter lettuce or something like that. You're eating the outer rosette of leaves as well as a, a nice little head in the middle. But boy, the color variation and the shape and size and the leaf types, it's like being a kid in a candy store. And I love to eat that stuff and it's cold hearty. I could go on for an hour, but that's, I love those things. And everybody who, once you become a chicory uh, enthusiast, boy, it's, it's, uh, you're in solid. You, I think you get as enthusiastic as I do. Oh, it's it's definitely my favorite family of vegetables these days. So if you could go. Yeah. I mean, there's a it's a fantastic. It's completely new flavor profile for what we're used to having, I think, in this in this. You know, it's not something you just find everywhere. So it's something I really do enjoy. And for those of your listeners who are a little trouble with the bitterness, right, which are the the North American palate is so bitter uh, adverse unless it comes to coffee or chocolate. In fact, the Chinese uh, uh, medical practitioners claim that the reason that Amer- Americans crave coffee and chocolate so much is because they don't eat enough bitter in their diet. And so chicory, chicory is a good antidote to that. Uh, but anyway, uh, for those of your listeners who don't who are a little squeamish about the bitterness, remember, no, you either braise it uh, with olive oil and some uh, braised onions totally changes the flavor and a lot of Italians eat it that way. Or you, uh, if you eat it raw, you eat it with again, good old, uh, good sweet onions and olives and a good vinaigrette and man, it comes alive. Then you can appreciate that little bit of bitterness. All right. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning CD self one thing, what would it be? Taste everything. I, I did so much breeding only with my eyes in the beginning. I knew flavor was important, but, you know, there's so many traits to juggle. Somebody once said plant breeding is like juggling. And, uh, you know, the better juggler you are, 
the more traits you can keep up in the air, in the air. Every, every ball in juggling is like a trait and there are only so many balls you can juggle and the better you get, the more balls you can juggle. But, um, I was really squeamish about tasting things because there were so many other problems. <laughs> I would taste it all. And I knew that that was a common concern, but, um, I now taste everything right off the bat, boy. And I try to get rid of that crappy tasting stuff right from the beginning. Cause I know that's, that is a very important part at the end. It's not the only thing, as we know, but it's important. John DeVazio, thank you so much for sharing your story and your experience and, and your insights with us today on the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Chris, it's, it's a real honor to be on this podcast. It's the hottest thing going for all the farmers I know. So, uh, boy, I'm going to be a rock star now that my farmers uh, have heard me on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay. okay, my friend. Thank you, Chris. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 74 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for the show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Navazio. That's N-A-V-A-Z-I-O. Don't forget, you can support the show by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. Again, that's farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd enjoy being on my email list, The Blind Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or at purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes. Leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to an ever-growing circle of listeners. Finally, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the suggestions form on farmer to farmer podcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. Mm-hmm.